Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. One of the things we've all experienced in the last year is our increased reliance on technology. And it's not only the amount of time we're using it, but an expansion in the types and the uses. Uh, many experts uh, reckon we've accelerated 10 years of technology adoption into one year, thanks to, uh, thanks to COVID. Not everything with technology makes immediate sense to those raised in the very physical world of the pre-dot-com era, when people actually read books uh, and went outside to play. Both things are very foreign uh, uh, to, to my children. Um, to help us understand why and how anyone would buy a tweet, for example, we are very excited to welcome Dr. Ben Kaczynski to explain how we got to where we are with digital currencies and what the future might hold for these, uh, along with all things IoT. So we're going to have a little acronym uh, uh, learning session today. As the George S. Craft Distinguished University Professor of Information Systems and Operations Management here in the, at the Goizueta Business School, Ben plays the role of introducing mind-expanding perspectives on technology, technology advances, and importantly, how businesses can leverage those technologies to leapfrog the competition, create value, and in some cases, scare the daylight out of global leaders firmly rooted in the comfort of the status quo. Ben travels in some very interesting circles in the internet world, recently bumping elbows with the likes of Snoop Dogg, The Game, MC Hammer, Elon Musk, and Bill Gates in The Clubhouse, which is an online space for casual drop-in audio conversations with interesting people around the world. Not a place I have actually visited, Ben. <laughs> Maybe you can invite me in one day. As with most of our sessions, Ben is going to spend about 30 to 40 minutes sharing a bit about the history and use of digital currencies and other technologies, and will set us up for the continuing this conversation with our session, our next session, which is on April 15th. So just remember that we are moved to a first and third Thursday of the month um, cadence for our business over breakfast. The session on April 15th is a session on blockchain uh, entitled, Is Blockchain an Opportunity, a Threat, or a Risk for You? And Ben is going to co-host that. Ben's talk today will be followed by time for a Q&A, so please pop your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to answer uh, as many as possible. There are two things, though, I want to uh, share before I hand it over to Ben. First, if you're looking for ways to find order in your world of mind expanding possibilities, or if you want to build competence in structuring ambiguous, um, messy problems, which uh, feel like they're all around us every day, then um, I invite you to join us for the Structured Problem Solving Program in May. This course is one that's really going to build your expertise and confidence managing the process of problem solving in a very systemized manner from framing the problem to communicating a compelling case for action. You'll find more about this and other opportunities on the Emory Executive Education website and we'll post a link to it in the chat. Second, we're also experimenting a bit and offering a deeper dive into the leadership pillars that Jamie Turner introduced uh, earlier in the year. Um, this deep dive is a series of four sessions. It does have a fee. Uh, as we need to uh, as we need to charge for it. However, for everyone on today's session, uh, we have a special offer. If you put your name in the chat, uh, and then when you register for Jamie's workshop, uh, you get to bring a friend along for free. So hopefully we will see you in Jamie's deep dive. And I know you're going to enjoy your time today with Ben. So over to you, Ben. Good morning, folks, uh, or morning. Uh, for some of you, it's uh, less about morning than, uh, uh, than uh, we have here. It's a rather chilly morning here for us in Atlanta, but I want to uh, welcome you and certainly offer uh, thanks for our uh, exec ed community, for Nicola, for uh, Christine and Jasmine and Pam have uh, been extraordinary in 
helping get uh, things running for these activities and these forums, which I very much enjoy as well. We'd like to start out with just a couple of quick questions on Menti for you. And uh, I know, I understand that you have a, a background here, many of you. So if you can, please spend just a moment, hop over to um, menti.com and uh, type in the code up there uh, in the top and type in your location. So we get a little understanding of distribution. SLPville. <laughs> All right, I want to know who did that. <clears throat> Toronto, New Zealand. Robert, I, I saw you there from uh, Korea. as well. Well, that gives us a, a sense of some of the distribution. Uh, we, we've got locals and global uh, folks uh, represented here today. Can we, um, let's move on to the next question. A couple of quick questions. Do you own any digital currency? Ah, actually, we've got a fair distribution here of folks. And it sounds like the uh, highest uh, figure is those uh, are those considering, uh, considering, but not having pulled the trigger yet on that. Uh, thanks. Let's move on to uh, uh, to the next question. Do you see a role for digital currencies in your market in the next five years? Doubtful's trending down, absolutely trending up. Actually, we're fairly, uh, fairly nicely balanced in that as well. Uh, thank you. Let's move on to the next one. If you were to mint and sell an NFT, what would it be? If, if you're familiar with it. No idea. What's NFT? No clue. Trading cards. Image, images, kids' art, there you go. You could pay for your kids' tuition for college now by selling their art in their youth as well. <laughs> Journal articles and wit, our witty quips as well. And uh, several what's an NFT uh, about I'm going to move uh, in now and uh, let's uh, take just a moment and um, so again, uh, again, welcome. This is going to be a, a rather a rapid process. And those of you that are uh, a shout out to all the SOBs, a student of Ben, who are, are on here. I know there are a good a number of uh, you folks who are SOBs, including Pam herself here in, uh, in our group, is a student of Ben from the from past as well. So I want to shout out to all the uh, SOBs and those. Um, <clears throat> the survey was there to tell us about you but in enough about you, let's uh, talk about me. 
so you understand a little bit of the context of my background. My background's in computer science, but I've always been in both computer science programs and business school uh, uh, programs at you know, Michigan, Arizona, Harvard, and, and uh, Emory, quite a, a time here at Emory. Uh, four courses that I generally teach are uh, in the executive uh, MBA program, about emerging technologies and adaptive systems and enterprise and inter-enterprise uh, digital transformation. Think.co.make, that's uh, more for the undergrads that has a lot of Python and JavaScript in it and maker technologies and maker approach uh, activities. As Steve Jobs says, uh, to you learn to program, you learn to code to learn to think. And uh, coding is about how to think about the um, environments and ecosystems of the modern period. I have a class called Appcology that deals with the ecology of apps, chatbot structures, AI, interactive uh, platforms, gaming platforms, virtual worlds, and so forth, that looks at emerging technologies that are transforming commerce practice. And I teach a course with the law in the law school with second and third year law students and a Fourth Amendment scholar in the law school about uh, privacy in the digital age and getting an awareness of the trends and beyond trends, what the expectations and demands are of different constituents on, uh, on privacy, which is very important. Uh, those of you who are SOBs know that my discussions of drink through a fire hose would be going at a good pace through a wide range of topics and themes, and very much of a shotgun structure that I don't expect everybody to get everything. We're not here to norm the group, but I do expect that you will each walk away with something that's relevant to you, two or three or four things that, uh, that uh, stimulate your thinking. My perspective is about core principles. We spend too much time looking at what's happening today at the T word trending and uh, what's going on in, in the immediate environment. We wanna look at what principles. So when we learn about a technology, what principles are underlying because that's how we understand where things are going. We're less interested in where they are then where things are going and to do that, you need to understand the uh, operating principles of an environment. And clearly the, you know, the first principle is that how you think is more important than what you know. <clears throat> we spend a lot of time trying, to, uh, and especially education is often targeted towards getting folks to know things, but we're more interested, especially in this high velocity, high adaptive community we're looking at how you think, how you think about the novel conditions, novel situations. How do you think about emergent practices? How do you think about prospective <clears throat> structures of your enterprise, of your market? And uh, those who SOBs know as well that the future's best seen with a running start. When I deal with CEOs, I know the ones that are, uh, very poor at looking at the future are those that say, here's where we are, where are we going? Uh, the, the future is best seen with a running start looking back. And even as uh, Churchill said, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you will see. And I believe that's absolutely true that if you wanna know where something's going, know where it's been and uh, use that to uh, exercise your uh, imagination and creativity and understanding where things are going. <clears throat> we have a plethora of uh, news items out and we tend to take each in stride. What's happening in this space? What's happening in uh, another space? And uh, I want us to uh, transcend that a little bit uh, today. <clears throat> so we see news like uh, in the IoT world, that uh, we establish protocols like Thread. Thread will allow you very low power, very uh, 
uh, short range communication patterns that will allow you to transform your house, will transform your car, transform the store that you're in or the office building that is much faster and much lower power than, than Wi-Fi, than Zigbee, than Bluetooth, which we're, uh, <clears throat> we deal with on, uh, on a daily basis. So innovation there, more importantly, it's about connecting heterogeneous devices. So it means that we can connect a lot of things that don't have to have high structure on it. How does that fit into what's going on in the world? We've seen of late the news in the, uh, in the equities market with uh, the Reddit teams and uh, leveraging Robinhood to beat the shorts. To, uh, uh, we have the institutional players that play the historical game and find distressed organizations and st establish short positions in them. And the Reddit uh, team, Scott, identified those, many of those short positions and uh, collectively leveraging, uh, <clears throat> leveraging Robinhood, uh, collectively started to buy individual shares and small uh, lots of those that drove the prices through the roof, uh, killing a lot of the um, short, uh, short holders. So in some sense, you want to look on it as a rebellion against the old institutional structure that um, has been colonized by uh, the traditional trading community that play their games within that community. <clears throat> and uh, so this is a revolt from the bottom that in some sense looks at defiance of the historic practice of equity sales. And so we saw the consequence of it is uh, folks like um, that were holders of uh, shares of Game GameStop for did pretty well. There's a, the employee parking lot for GameStop uh, shown there. A friend of mine, uh, Adam Aaron, is the CEO of AMC Theaters, and their stock was distressed, and um, they were saved absolutely saved by these actions of, of people that brought brought the uh, stock price up and allowed them to uh, restructure and refinance, much to the chagrin of the short sellers who were sitting at the side, <clears throat> uh, waiting for uh, them to uh, uh, kick. Obviously, it's more important a story to us, less from the financial activity near term than the defiance of the traditional institution of buying and selling equities. And so you have Robin Hood now filing for an IPO, who in essence were an engine facilitating that kind of revolution in those areas. <clears throat> we, we have the ongoing battle, that it's extraordinary battle of giants between uh, Apple and Facebook. And we also should mention uh, Google at the same time. <clears throat> I mean, Alphabet in, in part because um, uh, Tim uh, Tim Cook's initiatives with Apple in uh, challenging the uh, right to vacuum up information and use it without discrimination by entities like Facebook and like uh, Google as well, creates a perverse incentive for companies like that make over 90% of their revenues off of advertising to have a perverse incentive to collect any kind of information they can without, <clears throat> uh, uh, without respect to the ownership and use and the governance and control practice on here. <clears throat> so this battle is playing out, battle of giants. Uh, <clears throat> Apple themselves are promoting in essence, privacy as a service, as a key differentiator. Uh, Microsoft and Apple and Amazon do not make their money off of advertising and therefore they have less of a perverse incentive, less of an incentive to uh, voraciously collect information as well. And, and a group with uh, called People Centered Internet with uh, Vince Cerf and David Bray, who's in another SOB, who uh, <clears throat> were looking at uh, inversion. Uh, here's the founder of the internet uh, trying to fix what 
what evolved wrong incorrectly. And that, a lot of that had to do with the ownership and control of your information. So how do we turn this around so that you have choice, you have control and you have, and you get compensation if money is derived from the use of your information? Can we do that with our technologies and reverse the path? At the same time, we have initiatives like the solar, uh, solar winds hack that is a gift that just keeps on giving as, uh, uh, as we see the management of updates and control of the software is uh, corrupted in our historic channels of distribution. And we saw even just uh, uh, two days ago where the news that uh, Russia, uh, Russian hackers were suspected of uh, stealing not only thousands of State Department emails, but also Department of Justice information as well uh, via these engines. So we need to find some way of getting a different pattern of controls. We can control the pipelines and the gateways but the information is passive and it needs to be protect itself. And so we need mechanisms for things to protect themselves. Another partner with the PCI, with the People-Centered Internet is uh, Tim Berners-Lee, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was the inventor of the World Wide Web. And with uh, uh, Sir Tim, uh, with an initiative called SOLID, looking at the perspective of internet of things. When we have things talking, how do they know who they can talk to? And uh, how do we put security on these plethora of devices that are going out? <clears throat> we have 4 uh, billion people on this earth, more than half the people that are now internet ready, internet connected. But we need to give some thought to uh, the over 30 billion now. Sometime around 2008, we shifted over. There started to be more things than people on the internet. We're about 30 billion things that are either internet ready or on the uh, internet now. And now, as we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, we start getting digital assets that, are in, that have internet reach. Now we're talking about trillions not just a uh, mere billions of things. <clears throat> we uh, all have witnessed the, the rise and fall and super rise of uh, digital currencies, especially uh, the bit, uh, Bitcoin. And some of you, it sounds like, are holders of, of uh, Bitcoin, I hope <clears throat> quite happily so. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not bitter about the fact that in uh, about 2000, 12, 2011, I was giving a demonstration for my class and showing them how they could buy Bitcoin. Well, Bitcoin was $150. <clears throat> Let me repeat that, $150. And so I thought I'd invest $100 and show them how to buy it. So I bought a 0.6 Bitcoin and a typing in the password, it kept rejecting passwords while I'm giving the lecture. So I typed something in, it took it, and I went on with the lecture. Well, at that time, wallets were not very mature and I forgot what the password was. So I have a 0.6 Bitcoin that's riding around like 30% of the other uh, Bitcoin uh, <clears throat> that is totally inaccessible. It didn't matter to me when that was $100 that $100 is now over $30,000 and I can't get at it because I don't have a password. I know my dog's name is involved in the password. We have uh, several people ask what about an NFT and we'll get into what that is in, in a bit, but a lot of ch is changing, not us just in the physical world, but in the digital world as well. <laughs> So we're leveraging these crypto technologies that we utilize to create things like the digital currencies. And an artist, Eric, uh, I forget his last name, Winkleman, I think, or something like that is, he goes by the name of Beeple. And uh, Beeple's been selling NFTs and, uh, for a little while, but um, he made some news 
when he sold a a JPEG, and think of how many JPEGs you've got on your computer. He sold a JPEG for sixty nine million dollars at in a Christie's auction. That JPEG is has about uh, seven thousand JPEGs embedded in it as well. So it's a dang big uh, JPEG. But nonetheless, that's he sold a JPEG for $69 million. Uh, Jack Dorsey, founder of, uh, of Twitter, <clears throat> sold a, uh, uh, an, uh, a minted an NFT, a non-fungible token, and sold that on the market. He actually got $2.9 million for the first tweet that he, um, uh, so he minted that first tweet into a, an NFT and sold that out on the market for $2.9 million. So this should inspire you to find something, some digital garbage you've got that you can process in a market. Elon Musk took a, uh, a, a real crappy techno track, a song about NFTs and made an NFT out of it and uh, is selling that on the market as well. It's a pretty crappy song, but as Nicola mentioned that uh, Clubhouse is very popular with many of you now and, and with a lot of folks uh, on their interesting forums. <clears throat> and uh, I've participated in a number of forums. It is amazing the mix of folks that are involved in, uh, and uh, it's a time sink. You got to be very careful hopping into there. Uh, it's a shame we're not driving around much because it would be a nice uh, to listen to while you're driving. But you can go and uh, pop into rooms on different themes. There's some SOBs that run rooms on different topics. The Nomad X, Dave Williams with um, on, uh, Nomad X and others. But there are some great rooms on NFTs and how artists, visual artists, as well as music artists can leverage these abilities. There's a lot of caring and support for helping new artists get started. And by the way, obviously what's happening here is new artists and others are finding ways to bypass traditional markets. So bypassing traditional intermediaries, not unlike our Robin Hood story. Where, so I go into the room and the game is in there uh, and Snoop Dogg on, uh, on rapping and more important on how to train young artists to get into the space so that they can bypass traditional markets and intermediaries. And literally they were talking about $30,000, $40,000 for starter images from artists. Uh, obviously, the prospect that artists down the road, their things would raise in value, but more importantly, it will kickstart and support artists in, um, in their uh, uh, beginning stages that we might have as well. So the Beeple story is a dramatic awakening. It's not that it's new. There things were going on for the last few years, but that they became very dramatic as you get into some of these recent stories of uh, digital images and digital tokens, <clears throat> tokens of uh, digital artifacts that are uh, offered in the market. And it's not immune from companies too. NFTs are in the toilet. <clears throat> Charmin has to toilet paper themes uh, in crypto art. So a lot of players are playing in the space and it's, uh, it's as much sometimes a marketing initiative and inspiration as well to create collectible images or collectible artifacts from a corporation that might be. And so that begs the question then for many of us, what, what an NFT is, <clears throat> because many of us are uh, looking like Tucker Carlson and uh, uh, surprised cats and a few dogs, although I have more respect for dogs because uh, I only have one there. <clears throat> who is bewildered, but Tucker's always bewildered and the cats are as uh, often as well, as well too. What the heck's going on here? And those of you that know me <clears throat> know that uh, 
I pay close attention while many are focusing on velocity. What's changing? I hate the T word, what's trending? They're focusing and zoom in really quick on what's trending. If you really want to give thought to the evolution of the tech arena, you look at the acceleration, how the change is changing. So uh, acceleration is more important than velocity. So we want to spend some time thinking about how the change is changing here and what macro things are going on. <clears throat> the stories I mentioned from the headlines illustrate a couple of, of uh, uh, mega trends and uh, mega initiatives and evolutions that are going on. One is the decommoditization that in, in old markets, in 20th century markets and in industrial age markets, we focused on, uh, if, uh, for efficiency, we had to commoditize things for comparison and we, uh, for efficiency and production and efficiency and distribution. Now we're able to, and in fact, it got so hard that it was hard to distinguish one thing from another. They were all, de uh, all commoditized. Now we're able to give an individual name to everything, individual name to a pen, individual name to a digital asset. <clears throat> And that we can decommoditize markets where we've historically only operated efficiently as commoditized markets. We're also decolonizing. This is a, a great uh, trend for this uh, century, is looking at decolonizing old structures, old infrastructures. And so among them, the stock market, you, we saw with the Robinhood and Reddit initiative, as we start to say, get away from it, or at least attack the old institutional structure and find new ways of recolonizing and reinterpreting. And um, I, I did a paper in uh, 1999 on um, uh, neo-intermediation in the equities market. And it was uh, about, uh, about this decolonization. How do we, it's not just disintermediating, but how do we completely disrupt our markets, market structures? And a part of that is to recognize we're in an age of enchantment. We're taking things that are passive and making them active. Things that are, the pen that's sitting here can have sense. It can know temperature. It can know uh, uh, humidity. It can say it's over here. Now it's over here. It can move around and tell where it's at. It can write a blog. It may not be read, 85% of all blogs are not read in any case, but this pen may uh, itself write a blog about, I'm sitting over here and now I'm over here. It may not be relevant to some, but <clears throat> things can now sense, things can now speak, can, things can now share and things can think and things can remember. So I can tell if a drug has ever been over a hundred degrees for more than an hour in its transit and this therefore uh, has lost its efficacy. And so this, trend, this is about both the rendered and the real. This is about not only just IoT stuff, but it can be about digital assets. Things that I create can now think. Things that I create can have an envelope of intelligence around it. Things that, can, uh, <clears throat> that I create and render in a digital world can have a sense of self <clears throat> and can have a sense of, um, of uh, control and a sense of contract and arrangement as well. So it's true of both the internet of things uh, area as well as um, digital assets. So it's true about stuff, the billions, 30 billion things that we can uh, <clears throat> connect with more so than the 4 billion people that we can connect with, but you get into digital assets where you'll be moving into the trillions. Trillions of things can now have an identity, have a, a purpose, have a not just data base, data lakes. We think of the data as a very passive, but that data can be active, especially my data. I want my data active on my behalf not on somebody else's behalf. And so in the world of the IoT side, 
Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, machine to machine communications. Things are gaining a, a sense of, of intelligence and are able to be sentient in some, to some degree or another. And those of you that uh, uh, know me as well, no, we're very attentive to how toys become tools because more often than not toys surface, I, I mean, technology surfaces in, in toy forms. And so we're, uh, we always wanna find how in these, those early stages, how those toys become tools in our market. It's not unlike the Saucer's Apprentice where we ourselves are able to enchant uh, the enchant inanimate objects and make them serve us and serve purpose. And so in, as in the Saucer's Apprentice, we are enchanting things in order to uh, as, have them serve our market, serve our ecosystem as well and purpose. Toyo, when we have hundreds of sensors in a car, we can get a few sensors talking together. And a decade ago, Toyota could have a car parallel park. Then we could add some more sensors talking with each other and we can do lane assistance. Then we can have not more intelligence and have the vehicle be autonomous. We can have cars connecting with each other, connected cars. We can have connecting on the highway. <clears throat> and all these things are about empowering or enchanting objects to have authorities. And that allows us in our perception to lay back autonomous vehicles. We can ride instead of drive on, on these activities. And as uh, you know, the story from the um, Saucer's Apprentice, much to our chagrin sometimes and much to our hazard. And still we're thinking a lot now about what things we can enchant and should enchant. And what does enchantment mean uh, for an individual artifact but more for a community, in your home, the things that talk with each other and coordinate <clears throat> in your car, in the, any what I call a captive area, in an elevator, in, your, in a retail center, when things come alive, what might, uh, might happen. And they're not only come alive in a robotic programmed coded fashion, but we can have some intelligence in there, uh, intelligence that brings, uh, even to the point of creativity, dealing with novel situations with AI elements that we can incorporate so that they can encounter that. <clears throat> and so we have emergent, a, uh, a logic a, that we can embed into these things, whether they're digital or whether they're real, that we can embed these things, often we call them smart contracts that we establish <clears throat> onto it. So in a traditional contract, if I'm H-E butt in Texas as a, a grocery chain and I'm ordering from Johnson & Johnson uh, Huggies or Pampers, I forget which they sell, I may in the traditional fashion say, I would want you to deliver 100,000 units to my uh, <clears throat> distribution center by April 1st in the traditional contract. Well, we moved in the law years a decade ago into more relational contracting where I might say, I'm gonna give you the sales information from my stores and I'm not gonna get in your face on your production and delivery. The relational contract is you have what I need when I need it. You make sure that I have in my distribution centers the amount I need when I need it. I'm not gonna tell you to put units in there I'm gonna feed you the information on my sales. So relational structures. So if we can do that with things, we can do that with uh, <clears throat> in different kinds of relationships as well and start making dumb things smart and placing uh, and embedding smart contracts around, not only in stuff, but also into uh, uh, digital assets as well. And so when we start to think about this, as we have over the last uh, couple decades, actually, looking at making digital things that are passive active, we come up in uh, 2008, we put out a, an architecture for 
a uh, uh, for a way of exchanging value, for uh, asserting exchange of value in safe ways, and uh, in digital currencies. So, uh, um, um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Nakimoto, and I put out an article. Uh, it creates an implementation, and I've got something I can use to exchange value. Well, a pity the poor pirate. I mean, imagine their life when uh, for hundreds of years, you get all this uh, booty and um, gold and stuff. You got to bury it on an island. You got to go to Oak Island and bury it. And ain't nobody finding nothing there now. <clears throat> and uh, so it's really tough to deal with value and value exchange if you're a pirate. It's a very dangerous job uh, to handle that. So if I'm a pirate, a drug dealer, or whatever it might be in a, in a dark space uh, dealing with exchange, <clears throat> I got a problem in the 21st century. I got these sovereign states that have a lot of controls over currency and, and currency exchange. <clears throat> and by the way, they got a lot of agents. They have these things called banks. They have these things called uh, gyro, postal gyro, banking gyro systems around the world. And all of them really create a lot of hazard for me to do the business the way I want to do it. So I can't trust sovereign state structures and I can't trust the banking structures in there. And I don't want my exchanges to be recorded. So I got to find some new way to um, a manage value and have value exchange. And it can't involve the governmental institutional structures. So I see this thing uh, coming about now, that's um, Bitcoin that um, th leverages the tech emerging technology of a blockchain that gives me an immutable record that I can start to build some trust around. It's uh, built around a consensus assertion that when you put something it in the um, in the blockchain, it is truth. And so I've got this now. I can have a ledger that I can put that everyone can agree when we mark something down in the book. And oh, by the way, I distribute this ledger, so I don't have to worry about the fact that I got to protect that book. <clears throat> that uh, ledger is distributed. So I start mixing these uh, con the concert of these technologies that allow me to create a value representation and value exchange. I'm not saying that these were developed for pirates, but I'm saying that often, as in often with technologies, we see uh, first use patterns are sometimes not what we uh, uh, are designing it for, what we might expect. So we have this um, Bitcoin that emerges in the market that uh, allows us uh, to, uh, Bitcoin and other currencies, we've got actually thousands of those, but we've got probably hundreds that matter. And some of you may be in Litecoin, Dogecoin, or, or uh, uh, other, uh, other factors that, uh, 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 coinage that you might be, uh, uh, might have been uh, interested in. But we start to create these digital asset exchanges that are extra sovereign. They're outside the sovereign state. And obviously the sovereign state's frustrated as heck by it. And, uh, and say it's outlawed, we're rejecting it. We can't watch it, so it's uh, illegal. And so more and more, we find that, that these things are rejected, organically rejected by uh, the sovereign states themselves as technologies. Well, until they start to learn the value of the operating infrastructure on those ecosystems and say, wait a minute, <clears throat> I can use this. And everybody thinks the Federal Reserve just would or organically reject it. Well, I, I've had the head of the Federal Reserve in uh, uh, for Atlanta in my, in my class who I was surprised the first time uh, they were saying how interesting they found the operating infrastructure of those uh, of those currencies, and uh, to the point where now 
you see the sovereign states themselves. And I uh, worked with the uh, group in Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, that that uh, does experiments on uh, new forms of economics and new forms of currency. And so we're able to say, wait a minute, a lot of these elements in here, not the whole thing. We're not gonna go the pirate route <clears throat> and tolerate it, but the elements, as long as you report it, as long as you record it, we're going to, uh, um, uh, we're, we're going to be able to leverage that. You start to see even now tax questions come out. <clears throat> even this year, many of the tax people are asking, did you trade in digital currencies? Because uh, the governments themselves are wanting to know uh, where assets are transferred into what forms for that. And so we have this explosive uh, change going on in uh, in this environment. And you're probably asking, certainly a, a number of you already have it. And many of you are asking, should I get into digital currencies and which coin, which should I buy? Which one should I invest in? And I would suggest you talk to three people. First, your financial advisor. And secondly, your psychiatrist. And thirdly, your soon-to-be ex-spouse in doing that. <clears throat> because we are in a wild ride again, yet again on, uh, on some of these structures. But what's important in, from our standpoint now and from commerce standpoint is not just the payment and currency side. It's that Bitcoin itself is a very limited. It's designed and operating for as an efficient uh, currency structure. But there are other forms of digital currency that have attributes that make them more repurposable for other domains hey, that, that I can, yes. Dan, can I interrupt you a second? We've got a question yep. that goes back a little bit to what you were talking about just a minute ago, and I wanted to make sure and, and touch on it here. Um, one of our participants asked for your opinion on the ongoing research on CBDC. It's in regards to the challenges faced by central banks on the growth of cryptocurrencies, <laughs> as well as the introduction of blockchain. Yeah, I, um, I I want to sort of end with some comments on, on that. And uh, I, as, as I was saying, the, um, the sovereign state structures are now extremely interested and to the point where, as you may know, was it yesterday or day before yesterday, the uh, uh, Chinese government wrote in um, digital currencies and blockchain into their five-year plan as a part of the structure. So while they start out often by uh, denying it, rejecting it, they're embracing these technologies now and uh, quite fairly so. Immutable records are very important and uh, building consensus and agreement on recording. So uh, in, in many respects, these are exactly uh, the trend is turning uh, right now to where uh, governmental structures and, and central banks are embracing these technologies. And that the Ethereum coin there in the bottom uh, represents a, a class that, that supports activities like the non-fungible non tokens. And as we've seen, uh, those of you that have watched the news and are just aghast like uh, Tucker Carlson, <clears throat> as you start seeing someone sell an image of a cat with a body of a pop tart and having a stream, a trailing stream of a rainbow uh, selling for, uh, hundred, for tens of thousands of dollars in an area. It's not unlike those of us that grew up with uh, baseball cards, or something like that. These are collectible. They can be replicated, but your possession of a, of a particular card or a, a signed card or whatever it might be, uh, creates a different set of value. Even today, as you see from uh, this image here, a Mickey Mantle tops card from 1952 is uh, on a market for $1.5 million. A uh, Ty Cobb card for $195,000. Uh, right now. So it, it's not that far to think about these, uh, what we're seeing today is crazy, but it's crazy like this crazy uh, that we've had in the past. 
NFTs, NFTs, that's all I'm hearing about. What is this thing? Hmm? Well, I want in on it, so let me have my share of So for some reason, uh, Mona Lisa has my voice and my gestures, but uh, her, her point is well taken. Wither the art world and as changing. So the types of things we're talking about, digital artists have moved into the space, but other forms of visual artists and music artists are moving in here as well. And uh, it's gonna disrupt, completely disrupt the historic. It's going to decolonize those historic market structures. And uh, so when we see something like the Beeple image that, that uh, uh, was sold for $69 million. And by the way, people sold other things along too, never to this, uh, to this level. As um, uh, it's not only changing the digital markets, it's changing the augmentation of the uh, other markets as well. Uh, one of the top spots- Ben, spot, uh, ben can I just interrupt? Right now. Sorry, yeah, can please. I just interrupt you a moment with a, with a question that we've had on the chat for a while? Um, where, where does ethics fit in to all of this? How, how do we think about this through the lens of ethics? Well, uh, right now in these markets, these are all volunteer players. So the question is, if you look on the Reddit side, is there an ethical challenge to independent, um, in, independent investors from Reddit collectively uh, bringing a stock up uh, by their individual actions and uh, uh, addressing the short. Uh, is that kind of rebellion unethical? Are, are, uh, uh, yeah, if, if you ask the, the short sellers, they would say, yes, it's unethical to do that. But if you, uh, uh, when you look at disrupting the market, they look at themselves as defying the pirates. So ethics is an interesting challenge here. Uh, we deal with two things in the space, what I call the world of can and world of should. Uh, we're talking about here what we can do. Now, what we should do is something that needs to be addressed very quickly as we look at the evolution of these markets. And so there is no absolute right or wrong. Many of us who worked on the internet from the beginning, from the uh, 1960s, late 60s and early 70s, as, as I did, are appalled and shocked by the things that we created and how they're used and exercised. And we want to remedy some of that. We thought that, uh, that social media would open things up, share information and have rational discourse. And we don't see that happening because of other market pathologies. So ethics is a great subject to deal with, but there is no easy answer here. These are shaping worlds and so the ethics need to be addressed and reflected early on. The NBA here is selling uh, vi videos of famous uh, actions and clips right now. Go to Top Shot, you go to OpenSea and see artists selling things now <clears throat> in uh, uh, NFTs, chubbies and, and why people, that, that first one there is uh, 0.15 ether, about $300. Why the heck is somebody paying $300 for that uh, GIF file? But what is happening is how they're in toy stages now. Toys abused and, and used properly. But how, as they move into tools, as they move into enterprise, as they move into societal practice, we need to pay uh, attention to it. Hey, Ben. And, uh, yes. Ben, we've got time yeah. for about uh, you know a couple more, one more slide and one more question. Um, and so I thought uh, there's a, another one that's been here for a moment that I thought you might be interested in answering. And that is how can these things be used for the quote, greater good? Well, I think first of all, a lot of it is, is being used for the greater good. So vast, uh, as I said, the early, early use and you see from Clubhouse, many of these people are using their, their uh, early wealth to support new artists and new people coming up. Almost every one of these big ticket sales are for charity. 
So a, a vast majority of these things are creating information not for personal wealth, but but for uh, for sharing uh, as well. So there there's a lot of greater good at the start, which is good, because uh, often greater good only comes later on. And there's a lot of unselfishness going on, which I, I'm almost amazed about. This is not personal wealth seeking uh, as well. China, as we mentioned, puts in blockchain and digital currencies. Last point, <clears throat> stop trying to fix the 20th century. We're in the remix era. Take things apart and shuffle them around like we've never been able to uh, before in the past. The 21st century is about reallocating decision rights and authorities. And we could talk, we could spend a whole session on that and this uh, decommoditization and decolonization. In our next session, we're going to hear from uh, a good friend of mine, Rup Singh, as we look at digital assets and transforming uh, value exchange, as he uh, will talk about value exchange in the digital asset environment. and. Um, uh, as he finishes his uh, new book coming out, uh, Profits in Chaos. So that's a commercial for our next session. And he, uh, let me stop at this point, since we have about 20 minutes left, no. <laughs> Thank you, Sorry. Ben, so much for uh, joining us this morning and for sharing your experiences and insights um, with us. Uh, I always enjoy, and as I always say, it kind of expands my brain. Uh, to hear about what's possible for the future. We also wanna thank you, our attendees, joining us as you saw from literally all across the globe um, from various places. We wanna share just a couple of things with you before you head out today. Um, importantly, coming up with our business over breakfast as we continue. For those who might not have realized as Jasmine put in the chat, we have changed to a first and third Thursday of every month. You'll see the upcoming topics. Ben just mentioned the one with Roop, which is on April the 15th. Then we're excited to welcome back Tom Smith with the popular economy and me and on May 20th, Curve Benders uh, with David Knorr. We'd also like to invite you to check out some upcoming courses with us. Go to our Emory Executive Education website. We have several short courses as well as workshops. And as Nicola mentioned at the start of our webinar this morning, um, any of you that put your name in the chat with the bring a friend for free with a paid registration, Air. Importantly, your feedback helps us tremendously as we shape our future. You'll have a search up in your browser as soon as the webinar ends today, and we appreciate it so much if you would take just a moment to fill out uh, that uh, survey for us. Uh, with that, Ben, do you have any uh, parting remarks you'd like to say as we close out today's webinar? No, just uh, keep watching the skies. As, uh, as the sci-fi movies used to say, because don't just look at what's happening, but think about what's happening uh, in concert. Great, thank you. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Yeah. Take care and stay safe.